Lesson 38. Comparison of adjectives concluded. The ablative of degree of difference. The dative with adjectives. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Lenny's Latin class. Today we're on page 115, and it's time to conclude our study of the comparison of adjectives. The authors of the book have decided to spread this over three lessons for some reason, perhaps because of all the irregular forms. You'll notice that many of these words are very common. You see them quite a bit, especially in Caesar's Gallic Wars. So I almost get the feeling that there's lots of vocabulary to cover, not just different forms, but also just a large number of new words. So anyway, let's go ahead and jump on into the lesson here in section 307. Let's read what they have here. Some comparatives and superlatives have no positive, but are referred to corresponding adverbs or prepositions. So in this section here, we have words where the positive isn't really even an adjective. It's just a preposition, such as the, uh, the very first one listed here, kis kitra, which means on this side. We've already studied this word, actually, with regard to the Alps. We talked about Cisalpine Gaul and Transalpine Gaul. Cisalpine meaning Gaul on this side of the Alps, Transalpine Gaul meaning Gaul on the other side of the Alps. If you think about uh, the way Italy is shaped, it's a big peninsula, right? Uh, shaped like a boot that sticks out into the Mediterranean. And at the very top of it, where it connects to the main continent, some of that area up there was also referred to as Gaul. And then right after that, if you're heading north or to the west, you would hit the mountains known as the Alps. And then once you got on the other side of the Alps, that's where the main part of Gaul would be, uh, the part that is today France. So the much smaller part of Gaul that was at the very top of Italy, that was called Gaul on this side of the Alps, or Gallia Cisalpina. Notice the word kiss there is attached to Alpina. So Gaul on this side of the Alps. And then the larger part of Gaul was called Gallia Transalpina. Notice the word trans there, saying Gaul on the other side of the Alps. So you've already studied kiss as a preposition. I believe kitra is simply an alternate form of that preposition. So then we have the comparative form kiterior, which means, well, they give the archaic word hither which simply means something like uh, to here. It would sound kind of funny to say uh, on this cider, you know, as a comparison. Maybe you could say more on this side in the sense of closer. And then kitimus means hithermost, which basically means the closest, or as they give here, hithermost. Moving on, we have the preposition in and also the preposition intra, which means within. We have the word intra in many English words, such as intranet. If you have an intranet, it means a computer network that's within uh, your own house or your own company. It's how people within something connect to each other. Not an internet. Inter means between. So internet is how you connect with other people outside of your organization. An intranet is how you connect with people inside your organization. Also, if you go to college, you'll probably see the word intramurals. Intramurals are the games or sports that you play within your walls. Okay, intra means within, and then mural comes from the root word that means wall. It's muros. So an intramural could involve one dormitory playing a sport against another dormitory. The comparative is interior. Of course, that comes directly into English as interior, that's inner. And then intimus means inmost. It's got to be related to our English word intimate. On the next line, we have pri and pro, two prepositions that can mean in front of. Pri is where we get our English uh, prefix pre. In fact, the word prefix has the word pri at the front of it, but somehow we lose the letter a. And so P-R-A-E, pri in Latin, comes into English as P-R-E. So pricato becomes English precede. Pridelectus becomes English 
predilection. Okay, so we lose the letter A there in the uh, prefix P-R-A-E, pri. So pri and pro mean before. In physical space, they can mean before in the sense of in front of. The comparative prior, uh, again, that comes directly into English as the word prior. If I give you prior notice about something, that's notice that I'm giving you before something happens. In Latin, it means former, and then primus means first. That's the superlative. Of course, in English, we have words like primal and prime. For primus, we don't say it means firstest or beforest, but that is what it is. It's the beforest of all, which makes it first. And in fact, primus is how you say that something is first in number. That's what we call an ordinal number. So primus, prima, primum means first. Alter means second. Alter, altera, alterum. You also see secundus, secunda, secundum, meaning second. So a couple of different words for second. And then for third, it's tertius, tertia, tertium. Primus here is the way you say first in Latin. Moving on, we have ultra, which means beyond. Another preposition. We have this word in English too. If you have ultraviolet light, that means that on the color spectrum, something is at the very top of it, or perhaps over on the right side of it, and it's a color that's even beyond the color violet. So it's beyond violet, and therefore ultraviolet, or uh, abbreviated UV. On the other end of this color spectrum, we have a, a warm red color, and so the Latin word infra means uh, below or beneath, and so if something is infrared, that means it's even below red as far as frequency goes. The comparative form, ulterior, means farther. Again, we have this in English. If you have ulterior motives, that means that you have motives that are farther or beyond just simply what the matter at hand might suggest. You've got farther motives, ulterior motives. And ultimus means farthest. And that's actually another way to say last in Latin. In fact, we've discussed many times how the final syllable of a word is called the ultima because it's the farthest or last syllable. And of course, in English, we have words like ultimate and ultimatum. If you give someone an ultimatum, it's kind of a last warning, you know, some kind of final challenge or warning. And uh, if I invent a new device, like if I invent a new vacuum cleaner that's special, I might say, this is the ultimate vacuum cleaner. And in that sense, it's ultimate in the sense that it's as far as vacuum cleaners can go. It's the last one in a series. It's the last one you'll ever need. It's, you know, there's nothing beyond it. So that's how we use words in English like ultimate or ultimatum. Let's move on now to section 308. Here it says, the following positives are rare except as nouns. So again, we have comparatives and superlatives that aren't really based on any kind of adjective as the positive degree. Here they're saying that the positive really is more of a noun, whereas in 307, the positive was more of a preposition. So on the first line, we have exterus, which I don't think I've ever seen in a text. Exterior means outer, and of course we have that in English. The word exterior means outer, like the exterior of your home might be made of brick or siding. Extremus means extreme or farthest. Of course, in English we have the word extreme. Inferos, on the next line, I have seen that in texts. When I've seen it, it refers to the underworld. You know, the ancient Greeks and Romans Uh, viewed the underworld as a place called Hades. Inferior is the comparative form. It means lower. And again, that word comes directly into English as inferior, which also means lower. In English, inferior can also just mean worse. And the superlative, infimus, which means lowest, 
And also you'll occasionally see emus, which means lowest too. So you'll see those words sometimes. On the next line, we have posterus. In English, we have the word posterity, which uh, means the people and generations that will come after you when you're gone. Posterior is the comparative form, which means latter. Uh, We actually have this word in English. It can refer to your hind quarters. Someone can kick you in the posterior, sort of a highfalutin term for your rear end. The superlative is postremus, which means last. On the next line, we have superos, the comparative form superior, which means higher. Again, that comes directly into English as superior, which means higher or better. And supremus is the superlative, which means highest or greatest. Of course, in English, we have the word supreme. You'll see this word attached to different foods. If someone bakes you a cake and they call it, this is the chocolate supreme, you know, it probably means that it's the highest or greatest chocolate cake. Okay, let's turn the page and go to page 116 to section 309. It says here, adjectives in EUS, IUS, and UUS, except QUUS, are compared by means of magus. Now, we talked about magus a little bit in the last lesson, saying that it has an adverbial quality. So apparently, magus helps to form the comparative of some adjectives. And then, of course, we have the word maxime, which is an adverb also that means in the greatest fashion or something like that. Magus can mean more, and maxime can mean most in an adverbial kind of way. And these adverbs work along with the example you see here, idoneus, which is an adjective that means suitable. It can mean pleasing or pleasant. So idoneus means suitable. Magus idoneus, more suitable. Maxime idoneus means most suitable. So here you have an adjective in Latin that's getting its comparative form and superlative form by working along with the adverbs magus and maxime. Let's take a look at our vocabulary in section 310. Our first one is pace, and the genitive singular is pedis. That's a masculine noun of the third declension. That means foot. We have this root word in lots of English words, such as pedestrian, pedal, impediment. Moving on, we have profectio. That's a feminine noun of the third declension. The genitive singular is profectionis. Generally speaking, third declension nouns that end with I-O like that tend to be feminine. So this word means departure or retreat. It's related to the verb proficuscor, which is a deponent verb that can mean to set out on a journey or to depart, things like that. Next, we have the word tourus, which is a third declension feminine noun that means tower. This particular noun is interesting because you will often see the accusative singular form ending with I-M. This is one of a very small group of words in Latin, uh, that is third declension nouns, that have I-M as their accusative singular ending. Finally, we have the adjective apertus, aperta, apertum. That's a first and second declension adjective. That means open or exposed. In English, we have the word aperture, which is the tiny opening in the front of a camera that lets light in. Uh, When you open the aperture, light can go in and touch the film, causing the picture to be uh, projected onto the film. So that's where we get the word aperture from. Moving on to section 311. This is probably the most important part of the lesson because here is where we're going to learn something called the ablative of degree of difference. In the last lesson, we learned how to say comparisons using the word quam or using the ablative of comparison. We learned how to say uh, this thing is shorter than that thing. Uh, This thing is smaller than that thing. So we know how to make comparisons, but in this lesson, we're learning how to say how much the difference is. For example, I could say this route uh, through the mountains 
is shorter than that other route by a distance of three miles. So it's shorter by three miles. So in this lesson, we're learning how to say the part about by three miles. We're going to learn how to express just what exactly the quantity is of that difference. And so the way we're going to do that is using the ablative case. You may have noticed by now that there are about 50 billion different ways to use the ablative case. Many, many centuries ago, when the Latin language was developing, the ablative case inherited the different uses of other older cases that fell out of use. So the ablative case is sort of a catch-all in a way that can express all kinds of different things. I have a little joke, in fact. I say uh, to my Latin friends, I'll say, it's easy to get carried away with the ablative. And the reason that's funny, in my opinion, is the word ablative actually means to carry away. Ab means from, and the L-A-T root word is from pharaoh, which means to carry. So that's the joke. And the reason the ablative case is called ablative is because its original usage was to show separation, that something is moving away from something else. So if you look in the historical grammar books, they'll tell you that the original usage of the ablative was separation, and so that's how it gets its name. Thus the joke, it's easy to get carried away with the ablative. I think that particular joke is the very definition of an inside joke because you need to know something about Latin to get it. And now, with the knowledge I just gave you, you can laugh at my hilarious joke. So let's move on to section 311, and let's start to take a look at our model sentences, and we will learn about the ablative of degree of difference. We'll learn how to show, when we make a comparison, just how great the difference is between two things. Model sentence number one says, Gladius est quatuorpedibus brevior pilo. Okay, we have a few different moving parts here in this sentence. The subject is gladius, which means sword. Uh, that's a short, pointy sword that the uh, Roman infantrymen would use. It was intended to thrust forward, so it was sharp and pointy on the end, not so much uh, sharp on the side of the cutting blade. So it's more of a stabby kind of sword rather than a slashy sort of sword. On page 29, there's a picture of some different kinds of swords. On page 38, there's a picture of a legionarius, uh, that is a, just a Roman infantryman, with his uh, shield and his uh, javelin. The shield is called a scutum. A scutum is sort of a tall, curved shield that you put together with the shield of the person next to you, and you can make uh, kind of a shield wall with it. And then on page 43, there's a picture of a pilum. I'm not sure how accurate these pictures are here, but they at least give you a general idea. But anyway, the gladius, or the sword used by a Roman infantryman, was a short, pointy sword, not a, a long sword that's sharp on the side edge, like you might see a medieval knight carrying, you know, in Arthurian legend. That would be kind of a long, cutting sword whereas a gladius is more of a short, pointy sword. So anyway, gladius here uh, means a short, pointy sword. And then the uh, verb is is, that's the word est. And then we have a predicate adjective, which is brevior. That's a comparative adjective that means shorter. So the basic structure of the sentence is gladius est brevior. Uh, the sword is shorter. The word pilo is the ablative singular form of the word pilum, which means javelin. And this is ablative of comparison. So in order to translate it into English, we need to throw in the word than. Okay, so brevior pilo says shorter than the javelin. Also, when they made this sentence, they could have put the word quam and then pilum in the uh, nominative case. They could have said brevior quam pilum, and it would have meant the exact same thing. But here they chose to use the ablative of comparison. So the sword is shorter than the javelin. Now we get to the important part, which is the part that says quatuor pedibus. This is the ablative of degree of difference. 
and it's going to show us by how much the sword is shorter. Uh, the paragraph of text below the model sentences, let's take a look at that. How much shorter is the sword? Is the way easier? The ablatives pedibus and multo, used in answering these questions, denote the degree of difference. The ablative of degree of difference usually answers the question by how much. So in number one, we have the sword is shorter than the javelin. You might ask, by how much? And then quator pedibus tells us. Pedibus is ablative plural, and it means feet. That's actually one of our new words for this lesson, pes pedis. Quatuor is indeclinable. That means that it doesn't change form. No matter what kind of noun it's agreeing with, quatuor just stays as quatuor. So you just have to imagine uh, that it's ablative plural along with pedibus. It doesn't get any kind of ending like quatoribus or quatoris or anything like that. Quatuor pedibus is ablative plural and it's ablative of degree of difference. So the way we interpret that is with the word by, we say by four feet. So number one altogether says the sword is shorter than the javelin by four feet. Or you could say the sword is four feet shorter than the javelin. Either way doesn't matter. Either way expresses what the Latin is saying. Moving on to number two, we have iter est multo facilius. The subject here is iter, that's the third declension neuter noun that means road, way, journey, or march. Est is the verb, that means is, and then facilius is a comparative adjective that means easier. It's the comparative form of facilis, a third declension uh, adjective. Uh, notice the I-U-S ending on facilius, that's a neuter Nominative singular ending. So iter is neuter and facilius is neuter. So the basic structure of the sentence is this. The way is easier. Now we have an ablative of degree of difference. That's the word multo. And it's going to tell us by how much. You know, how much easier is it? And so multo in the ablative singular says something like by much. So literally number two says the way is easier by much. Or you could say, the way is much easier. Either of those translations is fine. They both express what the Latin is communicating. In section 312, we have a rule that simply reviews what we've already learned. The ablative is used with comparatives to denote the degree of difference. Again, that's called the ablative of degree of difference. Moving on to section 313, we're going to talk about something called dative with adjectives. In fact, let's take a look at section 314 at the top of page 117. It says, rule number 24. The dative is used with adjectives implying nearness, fitness, likeness. Okay, so in section 313, take a quick look at the English translations of these model sentences. The Helwetians are next to the Germans. This place is suitable for a camp. The boy is like his father. When you say someone's close to something, like something, suitable for something, you can use the dative case to express what it's next to, what it's suitable for, or what it's like. So we're going to use the dative case to express those kinds of thoughts in Latin. So let's take a look at how they do it here in section 313 by examining these model sentences. Model sentence number one says, Helwetii sunt proximi Germanis. The subject here is Helwetii. The verb is sunt. That means they are. And proximi is a predicate adjective, agreeing with Helwetii. The adjective proximus, proxima proximum, can mean nearest to or next to. We see this in the English word approximate. So, so far, what we have says the Helwetii are closest or the Helwetii are next to. And then we have Germanis, which is dative plural. That's showing who the Helwetii are close to. So it's working along with proximi. Okay, so proximi Germanis says next to the Germans. Okay, this is called dative with adjectives. 
Number two is next, locus. Uh, by the way, there's a typo here in the textbook, uh, depending on which version of the textbook you're using. The second word should not be SD. The second word should be est. And if there's an I there, you should move it over to the next word. So the next word says idoneus. Okay, so that I is in the wrong place. Just take the I and move it over a bit to the next word. So the sentence reads like this, locus est idoneus castris. Okay, locus means place, est means is, and idoneus means suitable. So what we have so far says the place is suitable. And finally, we have a dative with adjectives. That's castris, which is always plural, right? And that's in the dative plural. So we'll translate it as camp. And the sentence says, the place is suitable for a camp. Number three is next. Puer est similis patri. Puer means boy. Est means is. Similis means like. And then patri is a third declension noun that means father. Here it's in the dative singular. Notice the letter I is the ending. So literally, it says, the boy is similar to the father, or the boy is like the father. Uh, the idea here is that he's similar to his own father. So in parentheses, in the translation, they've put the word his uh, in parentheses as kind of an understood word. So you can throw that word into your translation because that's what's implied, is the boy is similar to his own father, or he's like his own father, not just anybody's father. Okay, let's read at the top of 117. It says, uh, notice that after proximi, idoneus, and similis, the noun toward which the quality is directed is in the dative. This construction is called dative with adjectives. Okay, I think that section was pretty clear. Just watch out for dative case nouns with these kinds of adjectives, and you'll be okay. And of course, I'll point these out to you if we see them in the exercises. Let's move on now to our translation exercises for this lesson. Go ahead and do all the exercises. Now turn the recording off and translate all of them. And when you're done, turn the recording back on, and we'll go over them together. Okay, hopefully by now you've completed your homework. Let's go over the exercises together, starting with number one. Number one says, interior Gallia. Of course, Gallia means Gaul, and it's being modified by the comparative adjective interior. That's one of our new words for this lesson, and it means inner. So number one would say, inner Gaul. Number two, e loco superiore. This exercise is a prepositional phrase. The preposition e or ex means out of. Sometimes it can mean simply from. E or X, however you spell it, takes the ablative case. And so that's why loco is ablative singular. That's the noun locus, which means place. So out of a place is what we have so far. And superiore means higher. That's a comparative adjective. It's in the ablative singular, and it's modifying loco. Remember that most Third declension adjectives would have the letter I here as the ending for the ablative singular. We've noted in past lessons that third declension adjectives decline like I stems. But then when we started to study comparative adjectives, we noticed that those comparative adjectives, which are also third declension adjectives, they do not decline like I stems. You don't have the letter I in the genitive plural, and you get the letter E as your ablative singular ending instead of the letter I. So take note of the fact that superiore has an ablative singular form ending with E, not I, as you might expect from a third declension adjective. E loco superiore says out of a higher place, or possibly from a higher place. We'll see the same preposition in number three, ex inferiore loco. Here we have it spelled as ex because the next word starts with a vowel. In number two, it was spelled just with the letter e 
because the next word started with a consonant. So here you can see both spellings of this preposition. Again, it's taking the ablative case. So X and loco together say out of a place or from a place. And inferiore means lower. Again, that's a comparative adjective. And notice again, it does not have the letter I for its ablative singular ending like most third declension adjectives do. On page 253 in the back of the book, you can see the uh, paradigm for the comparative adjective longior, which we've already been over in a past lesson. No need to go over it again. But simply notice that it does not decline like the other, you know, I stem kinds of endings you get with other third declension adjectives. So we have an E here in the ablative singular, not an I. So number three altogether says, out of a lower place or from a lower place. Number four, ad inferiorem partem reini. Ad inferiorem partem is a prepositional phrase. Ad means to or toward. And partem is the object of the preposition. It means part. That's the third declension noun, pars, P-A-R-S, which can mean lots of things. It can mean part, side, or direction, or it can mean a political faction. Inferiorem means lower. We just saw that in the previous exercise. So ad inferiorem partem would say to the lower part, to the lower direction, or to the lower side. And then we have reini, which is genitive singular. That says of the Rhine, referring to the Rhine River. So it could be saying to the lower side of the Rhine, to the lower direction of the Rhine. Those don't really make very good sense, though. The one that makes the most sense is to the lower part of the Rhine. Number five is next, in ulteriore gallia. We have a prepositional phrase yet again. In here is taking the ablative case. Gallia is ablative singular. So in and gallia together say in gall. We have one of our new vocabulary words for this lesson. That's the adjective ulterior, which is a comparative adjective. And that means further. Again, notice that these comparative adjectives have an ablative singular ending ending with the letter E, not an I. So in ulteriore gallia says in further gall. Number six is next, ultimae nationes. Nationes means nations. It's a feminine noun of the third declension, and it's nominative plural. And so ultimae is also feminine, nominative, and plural, because it's an adjective modifying nationes. Ultimus ultima ultimum is a superlative adjective that can mean farthest. So number six says something like the farthest nations. Number seven is next. Ab extremis galliae finibus. Here we have yet another prepositional phrase with the preposition ab. That means from. The object of the preposition here is finibus, which means borders. Sometimes you can translate it with a collective kind of translation and, and say territory, because when you enter into someone's borders, you enter into their territory, right? So ab and finibus, we could translate as from the territory. Extremis, that's one of our new words for this lesson. It means farthest, and it's also ablative plural along with finibus. So ab extremis finibus, says from the furthest territory. And uh, extremis and finibus are sandwiching a genitive, which is possessing the territory. And that's galliae, which means of Gaul. Here we see that sandwich structure again. So number seven as a whole says from the farthest territory of Gaul. Number eight, in proximum colum. Here we have another prepositional phrase. We have in here taking the accusative case. Notice that colum is accusative singular, and that's the object of in. This is the third declension noun, colus, which means hill. 
So in and kolam say into the hill or into a hill, and proximum means nearest or something that's next to something. So we could translate number eight as into the nearest hill. To make it into good English, we might want to translate in simply as to, not necessarily into. If they're thinking about motion going toward it and onto the hill, we could possibly translate it as onto the nearest hill. It's really hard to tell what's going on here. In the absence of any better context, we could just simply say onto the nearest hill or onto the next hill. That might also be a good way to render it into English. Number nine is next. Cum proximis quitatibus. Cum is a preposition that means with, and it takes the ablative. Quitatibus is the ablative plural form of quitas, which means state. And in Caesar's Gallic Wars, uh, the different tribes or kingdoms in Gaul are referred to as states. And again, we have proximis, which means next to or nearest. So number nine could say with the nearest states. Number 10 is next, multo fortior miles. Of course, this is not a full sentence. It's just a sentence fragment for practice. But it contains what looks to me like an ablative of degree of difference, which we just studied a few minutes ago in uh, section 311. So here we have the word miles, which means soldier, and fortior means braver. So we have the idea of a soldier who is braver. It could possibly mean a soldier who is rather brave. You know, a comparison can mean rather something. Uh, so it could say rather brave soldier, but with multo here, it looks like an ablative of degree of difference. So we could translate multo as by much. And so then it makes more sense to translate fortior simply as braver. And so what that would give us is this, a soldier braver by much, or a braver by much soldier. Even smoother in English, we could say a much braver soldier. That's probably the best way to put it into the Queen's English. Okay, number 11 is next. Multo minor pars agmenis. Here we have multo again, looking very suspicious as, a, as an ablative of degree of difference. Pars here means part. Of course, it can also mean side or direction. Here it looks like it just means part, though. Minor is a comparative. It means smaller. And augmentus is genitive singular. That means of the army or of the formation or something like that. So literally, number 11 says, a smaller part of the army by much. Again, multo is an ablative of degree of difference. Or we could say a smaller part of the army by much. Probably the smoothest way to put it into English would be this, a much smaller part of the army. Not quite as literal, but it's much smoother in English. Number 12 is next. Profectio erat similis fugai. Here in number 12, we have the thing that we studied uh, at the very bottom of page 116 and the top of page 117. That's uh, dative with adjectives. So here we have similis, which means like, and then we have the dative singular noun fugai. That means flight, as in when you flee from something. The subject here is profectio. That's one of our new nouns for this lesson. It means departure or retreat. Here it means retreat, because that's what the context is calling for. So the subject and verb, perfectio and erat, say the retreat was, and then similis means like, and then fugai means to a flight. Okay, so the whole sentence says the retreat was similar to a flight, or the retreat was like a flight. What they're saying here is that someone retreated in battle and it wasn't really a tactical retreat where they were doing it in an orderly fashion. It was a retreat that was messy and looked like them, you know, fleeing from the battlefield. Number 13 is next. 
extremum opidum alobrogum proximumque helvetiorum finibus est genawa. If we were to strip down this sentence to its least complicated parts, we could take the subject, which is opidum, the verb, which is est, and the predicate nominative, which is genawa. So the stripped down sentence would say opidum est genawa, the town is Geneva. So that's the basic structure. Extremum is modifying opidum, that means farthest. So extremum opidum says the farthest town, and then allobrogum says of the allobroges. The allobroges are a Gallic tribe. What we have so far would say the farthest town of the allobroges, and next we have proximum helvetiorum finibus. The que ending, uh, Q-U-E, at the end of proximum, supplies the word and. It's as if we put the word and between allobrogum and proximum. So the furthest or farthest town of the allobroges and, that's the word order we'll use, and in this area of the sentence, we have a dative with adjectives. Proximum means nearest or next to, and it's working with finibus. So finibus is dative plural. So proximum and finibus will say something like nearest to the territory or next to the territory. And proximumque and finibus are sandwiching. We have that sandwich structure again. They're sandwiching a genitive possessive. Okay, so helvetiorum is genitive plural, means of the helvetii. Proximumque helvetiorum finibus says nearest to the territory of the helvetii or next to the territory of the helvetii. So number 13 as a whole says this, the farthest town of the Allobroges and the nearest to the territory of the helvetii is Geneva. Of course, the word opidum is understood along with the word proximum, the nearest town to the territory of the Helvetii. Number 14 is next. Locis superioribus occupatis itinere copias prohibent. This particular exercise starts out with an ablative absolute. Footnote number one says, see section 279. That's talking about ablative absolutes. So we have locis, superioribus, and occupatis, all in the ablative plural. Okay, locis means places. Occupatis is a perfect passive participle that means seized from the verb occupo. And superioribus means higher. That's a comparative adjective. So the basic idea here is that higher places have been seized. That's the basic meaning. As an ablative absolute, what it does is it supplies the circumstances under which the sentence is happening, or perhaps the backdrop or the background of the action. So we could translate it like this. We could say, with the higher places having been seized, blah, blah, blah. It could possibly have a finer shade of meaning like, because the higher places were seized or after the higher places were seized. We don't really know yet because we haven't translated the whole sentence. Perhaps we'll get more context as we go along. The main verb in the sentence is prohibent. Uh, That's the verb prohibeo, which means to prevent someone or to stop someone or to keep someone away from something. There is no dedicated noun in this sentence to be the subject. So we need to use the pronoun that's embedded in the verb. Prohibent is third person plural present tense. So that includes the pronoun they. So we can translate prohibent as they are keeping away, they are stopping, they are preventing, something like that. We don't know who the they are, probably some military force, uh, some troops. The direct object is copios. That's a first declension noun. And when it's plural like that, it can mean troops. This uh, noun can mean different things. In this context, it means troops. So the idea here is someone is 
stopping or preventing some troops, or someone is keeping away some troops from something. Finally, we have the ablative singular noun, itinera. That is the third declension noun, iter, a neuter noun of the third declension. That means road, way, journey, march, things like that. We're starting to get more context now. And so what it looks like to me is that itinera is an ablative singular, and it's an ablative of separation, working along with the verb prohibent. Prohibeo can mean to keep something away from something. And so I think what it says here is that they are keeping the troops away from the road or from the route. Again, there's no subject, so we're going with they as the subject. So prohibent says they are keeping away. The direct object of that verb is copios, which means troops. So they are keeping away the troops. What are they keeping them away from? Itinera, from the road or the route. And that's being communicated by the fact that it's ablative singular, an ablative of separation. So itinera, copios, and prohibent together will say they are keeping the troops from the road or they are keeping the troops from the route. You could even throw in the word there, T-H-E-I-R. The idea is they're keeping the troops away from their road or their route, whatever route or way they were trying to use, they're being kept away from it. So the ablative absolute here could be showing cause. It could be saying because the higher places were seized, they are keeping the troops away from the road. If you imagine a road with some hills on either side of it, and there are troops on the tops of the hills, that might strategically be a good place to be if you want to stop someone from using that road. So the ablative absolute here could be expressing cause, perhaps time. I don't know. It's hard to tell, but a very simple translation could say this. The higher places having been seized, they are keeping away the troops from the road. Let's move on to number 15. Sumus mons a labieno tenebatur. Here we have a passive verb that's tenebatur. That's a form of the verb teneo, which means to hold. So tenebatur is third person singular, imperfect tense. And so it means he, she, or it was being held. And the subject of the sentence is mons, which means mountain. So the subject and verb together say the mountain was being held. We have an ablative of agent here, which is showing us by whom that action was being performed. The prepositional phrase a labieno is what we call an ablative of agent. In the context of an ablative of agent, the preposition a or ab can be translated as by. And labieno is the ablative singular form of labienus. That's someone's name. Labienus was one of Julius Caesar's top generals. So what we have so far would say, the mountain was being held by Labienus. Finally, we have the word sumus here, which is modifying the word mons. At first glance, you know, the word sumus means highest. And so along with mons, you would think it would say the highest mountain. You might think that there are several mountains And out of those several, the highest one was being held by Labienus. But that's not what's being communicated here by the Latin. That's how we might say it in English. But for the ancient Romans, this is the way that they would say the top of the mountain. Notice a footnote here. Uh, Footnote number two says, Sumus sometimes means the highest part of or the top of. Infamous can mean the lowest part of or the bottom of, and extremus can mean the end of. So when you translate sumus mons, don't translate it according to English idiom or the English way we would say things. This is a Roman idiom that means the top of the mountain. It might take a little bit of getting used to to 
picture how this adds up, you know, grammatically. But number 15 as a whole says this, the top of the mountain was being held by Labienus. Number 16 is next, colus infimus erat apertus. The word colus here is the subject, that means hill. And infamous, again referring back to footnote two, it's going to say something like the lowest part of or the bottom of. So literally, colus infamous looks like it would say the lowest hill. But according to Latin idiom or Latin style, this means the bottom of the hill. The verb here is erat, which means was. And apertus can mean open or it can mean exposed. Here, probably the best meaning is exposed. So number 16 says, the bottom of the hill was exposed. Number 17 is next. Ad extremas fossas castella constituit. The verb here is constituit. That's a form of the verb constituo, which can mean all different kinds of things. It can mean decide. It can mean establish, fix, determine, put, place, deploy, station. It can just mean all kinds of different things. So here it's perfect tense, third person singular. So constituent will say he, she, or it placed, he, she, or it deployed, he, she, or it established, he, she, or it decided. And the direct object here is castella. That's related to our English word castle. It means fortification or fortress, and it's neuter, so this is plural, uh, accusative case. There is no dedicated word here to be the subject of the sentence, so we need to use the pronoun that's embedded or included within constituent. So the subject, verb, and direct object here will say this, he, she, or it established fortresses, or he, she, or it placed fortresses, I think establish is a good translation for here. Finally, we have a prepositional phrase, ad extremas falsas. The word falsa is a first declension feminine noun that means ditch. That's part of uh, Roman fortifications. When the Romans were fortifying an area, uh, like fortifying a, a fortress or, a, or some kind of military base, they would dig a big trench around it And then with the dirt they removed from the trench, they would put the dirt right next to it on the inner side to build a big wall. So if you're an enemy coming toward a Roman fort or a Roman oppidum, you know, that's the name they would use for a a big Roman fortress town. If you're coming toward it, first you'd go down into this ditch and then you'd have to climb this enormous slope First of all, you'd have to climb up out of the ditch and then over the big wall they made. It involved a lot of digging. The soldiers had to work very hard to move all the dirt. But once they did it, it made a very effective fortification. In fact, from what I've been told, in uh, France, still today, you can go and, and see the remains of these ancient fortifications that were dug by the Romans. Even after all these years, you can still see some of the contour of the land where they moved all the dirt to dig these big fortifications. So that's what a falsa is here. It's a ditch, meaning the big ditch that you would dig as a military fortification. The word odd here, we know that odd can mean to or toward. In the context of a gerundive, it can mean for the purpose of. But odd can also mean at or near. So I think here... The best way to translate it is at. Notice again footnote two, uh, it says extremos can mean the end of. So extremos falsas is going to say something like the end or the ends of the ditches. Not so much the farthest ditches, but the ends of the ditches. And along with odd, we could say at the ends of the ditches. So number 17 as a whole says something like this. He established fortresses at the ends of the trenches. Number 18 is next. Tures decompedibus quam murus 
altiores sunt. If we were to strip this down to its bare parts, uh, we could say tures is the subject, that means uh, towers, that's nominative plural. Sunt is the verb, that means they are. And altiores is a predicate adjective. So tures, sunt, and altiores says the towers are higher. That's the basic structure. Then we have quam here, meaning than. So then, the murus. Murus is a wall. Usually murus is referring to the walls of a city, like the outer protective city walls of a city or a town, not the interior wall of your home. There's a different word for that. So what we have so far says the towers are higher than the wall. Okay, the towers are higher than the wall. And finally, we have an ablative of degree of difference. That's the new thing we learned in this lesson. Pedibus is ablative plural. That means feet. And decim is an indeclinable number. That means 10. Earlier, we saw that quatuor was indeclinable. Even when it was ablative plural, it didn't take any kind of ending. It didn't become quatoribus or quatoris. And so that's the same thing with decim. Decim is ablative plural along with pedibus, but it's indeclinable, so it doesn't change form or ending. It does not become decimis or decimibus or anything like that. It just stays as decim. So together, decim and pedibus are ablative plural, and they mean by 10 feet because they are an ablative of degree of difference. So number 18 says, the towers are higher than the wall by 10 feet. Or you could put it into more smooth English and say, the towers are 10 feet higher than the wall. Number 19 is next. Monet ut omnes suspiciones vitet. The sentence structure for this one is one that we've covered before. They're giving us this exercise as a review. This kind of structure can be called different things. It's called by different names depending on the source. If you look in Allen and Greenow, uh, Allen and Greenow is the granddaddy of all Latin grammar textbooks. It's kind of an authoritative encyclopedia of Latin grammar. In fact, if you look in Allen and Greenow, they give this exact sentence as an example. It's in section 563, and Alan and Greenow calls it a substantive clause of purpose. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, why is this called a, a purpose clause? The purpose clauses that we've looked at so far in this book show the purpose why something is happening, the purpose for which something is happening. Uh, for example, if I say, I am going to the coffee shop so that I might purchase some coffee. That's uh, kind of a classic example of a purpose clause. You know, it's showing the actual purpose for some kind of activity. The one that we see here in uh, exercise 19 doesn't have that same kind of feeling to it. Here you have someone warning or instructing someone. In English, number 19, I'll just go ahead and give you the translation. The translation says, he is warning that he avoid all suspicions, or he is advising that he avoid all suspicions. So you have someone warning or instructing someone to do something. Again, in Allen and Greenow, they call this a substantive clause of purpose, but other sources don't call it that. From what I've read in the famous textbook, uh, Wheelux, you know, Wheelux calls it a jussive noun clause. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that title. But today, if you were to take a Latin class, uh, all the teachers that I've had in my life would call this an indirect command. And the recipe for an indirect command is some kind of verb of asking, advising, demanding, something like that, followed by ut, followed by a verb in the subjunctive that says what the desired action is. And that's exactly what we have here. We have monet, which means to warn 
or instruct or remind, things like that. Then we have the word ut. Then we have witet in the subjunctive. That's the first conjugation verb, wito, which means to avoid. Notice here that it's subjunctive with the letter E before the personal ending. Omnes and suspiciones are uh, accusative plural. Suspicio is a third declension feminine noun, and that's the direct object of witet. Okay, so number 19 says, he is advising that he avoid all suspicions. Or a smoother translation might be, he is advising him to avoid all suspicions. But that's not literally what the Latin is saying. A more clunky and literal translation would be, he is advising that he avoid all suspicions. Again, this is called an indirect command by today's Latin teachers. In Wheelix, he calls it a Joseph noun clause. And in Allen and Greenow, they call it a substantive clause of purpose. So you'll see this kind of structure with different names in different places. Uh, one last thing to point out before we go, and that is that this follows the sequence of tenses. Whenever you have a subordinate clause with ut, it's got to follow the sequence of tenses. Here, monet is present tense. That makes it a primary tense. And so, witet is also present tense. So, this particular example follows primary sequence. If you want to go back in this textbook and review that kind of structure, you can do so on page 81. Okay, only one exercise left, and that's exercise 20. Exercise 20 says, Pueri Hispaniam esse proximam Galliae. Okay, the verb here is didicerunt. That's a form of the verb disco, which means to learn. The four principal parts, disco, discere, didici. Okay, didici is the third principal part. That's the perfect tense, first person singular form. And so, didicerunt is third-person plural, perfect tense. So, didicerunt will say, they learned. And the subject here is pueri, that means boys. So, the subject and verb together say, the boys learned. Now, we're going to have some subject accusative and infinitive construction. I would actually classify this as indirect discourse because it's reporting what someone thought, said, learned, felt. They say that indirect discourse or indirect speech is initiated by verbs of the heart or head. And this is definitely a verb of the head because they're learning things, right? Hispaniam is the subject accusative within indirect speech, and esse is the infinitive verb within indirect speech. Okay, so that's the subject accusative plus infinitive construction there. Okay, so we'll translate pueri, and then we'll translate didicerunt, and then we'll throw in the word that. The boys learned that, and now we go into our indirect statement, hispaniam is accusative singular, and it means Spain. Ese is the infinitive that means to be. When you have a present tense infinitive, such as esse, it puts the action of the indirect speech in the same time scheme as that of the main verb. The main verb, didicerunt, is in the past, so esse will translate that with a past tense verb uh, in English. If it were a future tense infinitive, the action would be after the main verb. If it's a perfect tense infinitive, it means the action is from before the time of the main verb. That's how time relationships work in indirect speech. But here it's a simple, easy example with a present tense infinitive, esse. Again, didicerunt is a past tense verb, so we'll translate esse as was to put it in that same past tense feeling or, or time scheme as didicerunt. So what we have so far would say, the boys learned that Spain was. Then we have the word proximum, which means next to or nearest. Here we can translate it as next to. And then we have dative with adjectives. 
You can review that at the top of page 117. Galii is dative singular. So the idea here is it's next to Gaul. Again, that's dative with adjectives. So number 20 says, the boys learned that Spain was next to Gaul. Okay, that's it for this lesson. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again in the next lecture.